Welcome, Achievers, to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of January 18th, 2024. I'm, of course, your host for the day. I'm excited to talk to you about the various news that's happened this week. And, of course, the Xbox Developer Direct just happened as I am recording. So I'm immediately leaving from that to discuss it with you and break it down. Let's talk about everything we saw there, what we think about it. It was a pretty beefy 40-something minutes. We'll be getting to that, of course, in the main portion of the show. But, of course, we start the show with Not So Rapid Fire. But before we get into that, I want to thank you so much for, one, clicking on the video, two, like, comment, subscribing, or sharing with a friend, whatever you're going to be doing. To help out with the algorithm, if you're on a podcast service, five-star reviews, you know the drills. Thanks so much. Now, let's get into Not So Rapid Fire. Now, there was a bit of a hubbub about Ubisoft um, discussing players needing to get used to not owning their games, right? And that caused a little bit of a drama, I would say, uh, around people. Of course, people taking that um, the way it seems to have been intended with saying, oh, we need to get used to not owning it, something, and... Seems like in a little bit of the general kind of ecosystem of rich guys is telling you be like, hey, you know, get used to not owning stuff. It's not going to come across well. And of course, that was headlined and shown off by IGN and a bunch of people took it very wrongly. I want to give you the direct quote, or at least I'll try to give you as much of the direct quote, because one, it was a Games Is Your Stop Bit interview that I do recommend everyone go check out as it's very interesting. One, two, of course, we don't read full articles on the show, of course, if we want you to go give all these sites a click and these things. So I'm only going to be reading partial of what we need today, but I do actually recommend that. I read it. It was intriguing to see the thoughts of what a Ubisoft exec thinks about the games industry and also games. is having some of the best interviews out there, if not the best place for the real in-depth interviews that one, this show wants and two, what everyone should do to kind of inform themselves on how games are made and what's the thought process going into them. So, Let's go to straight to the interview, and then I have a secondary thing that I'm going to be going to after that, too. So this is kind of in the middle of the article. It's going to sound, you know, a little, a little disjointed because I'm just jumping right into it. But it's the it's headlined the new Ubisoft Plus and getting gamers comfortable with not owning their games. And <coughs> excuse me. And this is, of course, a Ubisoft Plus. Or sorry, this is an article on Gaming Street Up is by Christopher Drink. And it's very intriguing. Let's talk about it. There's a lot of debate around subscription in video games. Today, the business model is the dominant way of paying for TV, film, and music. But that's not currently the case in this industry. Games are typically much longer. Many of them are free or feature some sort of monetization. And AAA publishers have agreed that the numbers just don't add up. Now, let's skip to what I think will cement what I'm going to be jumping into a little better and what's kind of been the talk of this interview. The question remains around the potential of the subscription model in games. Trembly, Tremblay, which is the gentleman's name, I think we get his full name in a second, if not, I'll go back, says that there is a tremendous opportunity for growth, but what is going to take for subscriptions to step up and become a more significant portion of the industry? Now, of course, that's the question. Now, before we get into that, let's get this gentleman's name, because I have blinked on it. There we go. Philip Tremble, Director of Subscriptions at Ubisoft. Quite the name. All right, I should say quite the title. Quote, and this is, of course, back to the question, quote, I don't have a crystal ball, but when you look at the different subscription services that are out there, we've had a rapid expansion over the last couple of years, but it's still relatively small compared to the other models. He begins, we're, see we're seeing expansion on consoles as the likes of PlayStation and Xbox bring new people in. On PC, from a Ubisoft standpoint, it's already been great, but we're having to look to reach out more on PC and we see an opportunity there, quote, or the quote continues. One of the things we saw is that gamers are used a little bit, are used to a little bit like DVD having and owning their games. That's the customer shift that needs to happen. They've got comfortable not owning their CD collection or DVD collection. That's a transformation that's been a bit slower to happen in games. As gamers grow comfortable in that aspect, you don't lose your progress. If you resume your game at, at another time, your progress file is still there. That's not Bedillion. You don't lose what you've been built in the game or your engagement with the game. So it's about feeling comfortable with not owning your game. The quote continues here. I still have two boxes of DVDs. I definitely understand the gamer's perspective with that. But as people embrace the model, they will see that these games will exist. The service will continue and you'll be able to access them when you feel like it. That's reassuring. Streaming is also a thing that works really well with subscription. So you pay when you need it as opposed to paying all the time. End quote. I found this all very intriguing. Of course, this uh, continues on if you want to go over to the article. There's a bit of 
there's a bit of both sides here that I'm going to kind of play with this. One, it was intriguing about a couple things he's saying here. So he is saying a couple good points, right? There's a lot of things that people have been gotten used to not owning. I think it sounds a little more nefarious than what he's putting it in. So, for instance, like he said, DVDs and the music industry specifically have been used to not owning things, right? Like who owns like their music much anymore, right? You're probably paying for Spotify. You're probably paying for Apple Music. And you probably buy the like ones that you really love physically. But music, I imagine, is... I mean, how much of music is just digital at this point? Who knows? Um, I'm sure that stuff is out there. But he does have a point in movies, I'm sure, is even more that realm. And games have been much slower to fully going over to the digital side but we're seeing that increase year over year i find him interesting saying a couple of these things because we have been very used to uh for digital things but i know we have uh some recent evidence that physical is a lot more than what we thought originally and originally back um well, probably a decade ago, it was 50-50. now it's something like 60 to 70 percent more of digital so i'm, I'm unsure what specifically he means as how hard this needs to go into in specifics in gaming, because we are already kind of gone pretty fast in my opinion, at least, uh, about how we're going. And he almost seems like he's mentioning as this, as, as the reluctance to owning something like it will go away at some point. I mean, we are seeing that in a lot of these services too. And if something leaves a service, you don't get to own it. Now with Ubisoft plus specifically, that's much less likely to happen because you're paying for Ubisoft Plus specifically to play Ubisoft games, so they don't have a reason to take it off. But for the other subscription services, of course, that is a problem. So it does seem like he's taking problems from other services and applying it to his own or something like that. I'm not sure, but I thought it was interesting to at least expound on what has been going around in kind of like just the headline for this. And this also leads into a very interesting tweet that I found from... Um, I believe it's pronounced Fen Vink. And this is, of course, a developer at Larian Studios. I'm for, right, let me grab his position really quick. Yeah, he should. Yeah, he should be the director of Baldur's Gate Three, of course, at Larian. Oh no! Oh no! no yeah, directed by. There we go. Yeah, it's right there. Yeah, so he directed. He's the director of Baldur's Gate Three. Just wanted to double check on that before I get anything wrong. But he did say something interesting in a tweet and. It is in reaction to the headline of the IGN thing that went everywhere. It was like not com comfortable not owning their games for subscription to take off. And again, I think a lot of people taking that slightly out of context. But so he says this in, in a retweet of it. Whatever the future of game looks like, content will always be king. But it's going to be a lot harder to get good content if subscription becomes the dominant model. And a select group gets to decide what goes to market and what not. Direct from developer to players is the way. Now, this is a man who knows... A lot about big games, big AAA games, and how to make their money. And he is telling you, uh, one, he already told us, I believe it was him that uh, earlier said why Baldur's Gate would probably not come to Game Pass. And we're seeing more reasons on why that also will probably not happen as well. He, he's saying specifically, hey, look, uh, this isn't going to work because this is how money needs to be made. And this is how we get better content. Because, you know, you start from a person versus this kind of committee of of the subscription business to decide what happens and of course opinions will be varied on this specific issue but i still find trouble with game pass let i'll save my game pass talk for later in the show as of course this is not so rapid fire so uh i should i need to move on slightly more to the rest of the show because i do really want to talk about the developer direct but i have been due to just make a giant overhaul game pass video and just really discussing the nitty gritties if you follow my twitter you found i had some very interesting conversations with the more uh hardcore xbox community um what's that? colt eastwood is his name uh he retweeted one of my things of course that gate got me a lot of traction with uh people who um Trying to uh, trying to be civil with how I put this. Um, who don't know too much of what they're talking about in specific regards to what I'm discussing? Because of course it's Twitter. You, uh, you're most people come at it either combatively or with not the full information of what you have because that's just how Twitter is. It's short form. You're not really getting essays from people, right? You're getting these small little slits of uh, conversations. So I don't blame them. 
but I did have a bunch of conversations and it was intriguing to see kind of the vibe of people who are really into it and how some people see how Game Pass works and how it, how it would feed into things. But let's move on. Prince of Persia reviews are out. have been very glowing. I'm shocked. I think everyone is a little shocked of how well this reviewed. It seemed to be very popular. I'm curious to see if it tracks on the sales this, this month or not. Uh, because it doesn't seem like a conventional game that would hit it, but January is a kind of slow month, so we might see something hit the number one spot there. Who knows? Views, of course, uh, uh, going great. You could go to IGN, GameSpot, whoever you love to go see a good review. I will be playing it probably tonight, as I'm looking forward to giving it a try. I'm not a big platforming guy, so I'm looking forward to uh, branching out, I guess I should say, because I don't really play them much, really, at all. Um, I, I only really play Mario's and of course, um, Celeste was one of my favorite games, um, like top 20 favorite games. So like, you know, n n nothing crazy, but I did love that game very much. Uh, Last of Us Part 2 reviews are out. Of course, this is the PS5 port that is coming very soon. Uh, I should say very soon. As of, uh, as of your listening to this, it's, it's out right now. Of course, that's a $10 upgrade to the game that you get if you have bought the game prior. So $10 to get a big glow up you should say in the game and i'm excited to jump into that i want to try out no return they did say you get your trophies reacquired i should say uh if you i assume upload your save they didn't say if that if that was the case i assume that's how you're gonna get it so you start the game upload save boom you get all your trophies i'm thinking of not doing that i'm thinking of just doing a playthrough getting like trophies and then uploading the save i know that sounds silly but that's what i kind of want to do because you know, I like trophies and I like achievements and it does add to the experience. So I do like the pop feeling when you get one like, you know, so I might leave that experience there to just get that. So I don't have to get all the collectibles in these things. But I don't know. I might just upload the save and maybe do a playthrough. I haven't decided yet, but I'm excited and I want to try out No Return. Uh, you'll have all those impressions very soon on either the next show or if I think it will do well enough, maybe a whole new video. Who knows? Rock City co-founders Sefton Hill and Jamie Walker have formed a new studio called 100 Star Games. This was first reported on by Polygon as they uh, didn't officially mention it, but they found the, uh, what was it? Um, they found a website, I believe, or they found like some link that well, they wrote a report on. The studio is located in London and it already has about 25 people working there. Uh, so read about this more if you want. There's not much here. I try to keep studio openings, you know, brief. And this is a perfect example of that. Until Dawn film is going to be in the works. The story is via IGN. Sony Pictures is working on a movie adaptation of 2015's PS4 exclusive Until Dawn, which was originally made by Supermassive in collaboration with PlayStation. The film will be directed by David F. Sandberg, who directed Shazam 1 and 2, and the script is being written by Gary Doberman, who worked on Annabelle and The Nun, and I believe... Um, he did other Annabelles, too? I recently watched all the Conjuring movies. And although those two specifically aren't mentioned, I, I think he made other ones, which, you know, I don't hate any of them. It's just, you know, I like the I like the main conjuring ones better for sure. Like with the uh, with the Warrens, like those are my favorites, of course. The other ones just kind of feel like eh, these are fine. Like if you want extra lore or something, but I like them fine. Um, I'm excited. I tweeted about this. I'm not really excited. Why did I say that? Um, I tweeted about this funny enough because it, it, this is as if, if if a book that was based on a movie was made into a movie kind of feeling where it's like Until Dawn was definitely meant to be a narrative driven story driven obviously take on a game that was like a slashing slasher horror movie. So it looks like we're going to get a slasher horror movie based on the game that's based on slasher horror movies. But the premise of it was you would play it as a game. So I find that very weird. It definitely feels like PlayStation is like they got a bunch of people in Sony Productions and are just looking at their IP like, what can we make stuff out of? We own this. Like, let's make something of this. Let's see who we can get to make it. We got them. Uh, boom. Send it. Like, kind of feels like that's what we're doing. We're not really trying to go at it the I don't know. It really feels like we're kind of just throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what happens. Like, it feels like we're almost already got like the givens, right? Of course, Uncharted, that makes sense. Again, another thing that was based on, of course, based on like Indiana Jones and Troop Raider that was made into a, a movie, which is like a full circle type of thing, which is funny. Um, 
and then of course we're getting God of War. We're getting we got Gran Turismo. We got um we're getting uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. All these things. So it just it, it feels like we're already kind of like what else can we do? Uh, I would much have preferred um, Order eighteen eighty six or something like that. I imagine they they um that would have been much more interesting. But eh, there we go. So this was funny as it kind of how do I put this? Um, how I usually talk about we struggle with um, games journalism in this industry. I think this is a perfect example on why one that is correct two, it's almost like kind of a speed at this point. Cause a lot of things think like certain things like this kind of happen and like almost everyone major reported on this without really clearly contacting the source. Fine. I found it very weird uh, that we, that we all jumped on this. Um, without reporting a source, especially considering the or original source was, I mean, no one heard of them. So, like, they really just were like, yep, this sounds good to me. So, I'm going to read you the full story, and then I'm going to uh, read you the thing that pretty much confirms that this is dead. Originally reported by Respawn First, Take-Two will be taking Remedy to court over Remedy's logo being too similar to Rockstar's famous R-Star logo, right? If you... Of course, I think everyone here knows what the Rockstar logo looks like. And then St uh, Steven Tatilla reported on Twitter that qu that says this, quote, A remedy rep tells me there is nothing to see here. Uh, inter quote, of course. Uh, this was a discussion between our teams that was resolved entirely and amicably late last year. And end, end quote. Uh, the legal filing was simply an initial formality and remedy and take to continue to work together in partnership. That is the end of the inter quote. Uh... Yeah, so everyone reported on this, didn't contact the original source before airing this, and just, like, took the original source at their word. This kind of, like, proves uh, that we do have an issue with this in our industry. Like, uh, and I understand, like, like I didn't I didn't go to each story and, like, read who wrote it, right? So maybe it's some random guy who's getting paid 20 bucks or something. I don't know. I, I don't know. But these were all aired on, you know, the major sites didn't really get any sort of uh, vetting it seems like and they just kind of went for it and that's sad to see as it's just like further proof that we're struggling to like be really on top of it a lot of the time and it's not like just one suit uh, site did this i saw i want to say game spot agn um it's all that's all i'm pretty sure i remember seeing so when I when I mean we struggle with gaming journalism and journalism in general in this industry, this is a perfect example. I said it in the Insomniac leak when I covered that, covered the discourse and all that. If you'd like to go hear my thoughts on that, that's a video I've already done with extensive timestamps that you can skip around in. If you'd like to minimize like the leak information in these things, I have it all written out for you that you can skip around uh, just to hear my talks. But speaking about that now and this it's it's we pick what we want to report on uh i like ergo the insomniac leak like we're picking on what we report and telling people that is silly to me uh at, i'm not gonna get into it um and then right here we have a prime example of we rush to market a story it's i mean it's pretty much false and there we go Now, let's go to Microsoft. We have a couple Microsoft things to say. They have had quite the challenge with the hit 2023 uh, Baldur's Gate, the hit of 2023 Baldur's Gate 3 coming to their platform as they've had saves being lost due to how the game syncs with the cloud and quick resume affecting how the game manages those saves. On top of that, a player has received a one year ban from Xbox Live as they took a screenshot of a spicy scene in the game. And since media is uploaded to Xbox Live automatically, the post was flagged for nudity and he was banned. He, she was banned. Uh, one, this was a little funny. Uh, I felt very bad for the individual, though, because uh, one, I did the same thing. I took a video to show my wife of a, a specific scene that had some spice in it. Uh, luckily, no one looks at uh, your I don't know who flagged this guy, like who's looking at like their feed of Xbox to like see this. But, you know, someone out there did and they flagged it for nudity. There was obviously nudity because the game features nudity and he was banned. I find that incredibly weird. Uh, 
wouldn't you think that because Xbox, of course, um, talks about this uh, or sorry, responded to this specific thing. Um, and before I say what I'm about to say, let's read their response. So this is originally from IGN, but they tweeted this out. So the situation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so quote, um, oh, wait, no, this is, blah, 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 no. oh, sorry, I'm reading the wrong thing. So let's get to the statement. This was an Xbox support tweet. To provide clarity on the Baldur's Gate 3 mature content enforcement actions, Xbox account suspensions are not automatic. Each clip is reviewed by a moderator, and if found in violation of our safety and content policies, actioned accordingly. Our team evaluates appeals and can reverse suspensions if action was taken in, in error. If this was a first offense, for example, we will remove the suspension and let players know why it happened and how to avoid future is issues. Um, ergo, how to turn off auto upload when sensitive content is captured. And then they link on how to turn off auto uh, uploaded. So this is strange, right? So a person gets banned for uploading a clip from an M-rated game. But the M-rated game is on your platform and it exists. And I get what, what probably everyone's thinking in their mind. It's like, well, of course, like someone isn't like consenting or something to seeing that. So if they see it on their thing, that does get an issue. And there is a gray area here. I'm, I'm surprised there isn't like a flag this content for like sensitive or flag it as sensitive so it doesn't show up in people's feeds or something obviously auto upload is a way of contradicting that but like the game is on the platform so why is it like this kind of negative thing that you're capturing con i mean like you're capturing content in the game that's in the game that's on the platform and you can get a ban for that obviously i get i get it it's for very specific situations but and it makes sense in the vacuum, but you get something like this and I'm like, but like if someone wants to experience the game and then show it to someone on Xbox Live, that is a bannable offense. That's pretty weird because it's in the game. You would think that there would be a background settings where it's like, don't show me sensitive content. You're able to mark the content as sensitive. And then if you abuse that system, that would get you banned. But who knows at the end of the day you know nothing's ever gonna be done about this i just thought it was an interesting thing to bring up and we could discuss about um of course the um problem with the saves has been fixed i believe this week and if it should be in a system update if you didn't automatically update you should be able to update manually and be able to get the saves not uh eating or get Baldur's gate 3 not eating its own saves due to how xbox uses their auto sync cl cloud functionality all right, let's move on to Hogwarts Legacy. Let's talk about this game even more for some reason. <laughs> Hogwarts Legacy tells 22 million copies in 2023, 2 million of that being just in December. These numbers are via a variety interview with David Haddad, I believe is how you pronounce it, WB Interactive Entertainment president. In the interview, David teases that more games in the universe are on their way. Uh, I wanted to highlight this one. This is very very important to the industry in terms of how sales work we're going to touch on that a little later but this is a very big deal that it sold this much it actually also call of duty in that year now and that has been done in almost a decade like nearly a decade it's like 15 years something like that it was like like last in 2008 or something like that and that was pretty much before call of duty became what call of duty is so I thought it was interesting to bring up one. We're going to see a lot more Harry Potter things. Just get ready for that uh, because of how of that fat thing. We're already getting the uh, Quidditch game that was in alpha testing recently, I think. Might have been beta testing. I don't remember. But I thought this was interesting to bring up one. It shows, hey, single player still works. And we've gotten that over and over again. But I thought it was still interesting to bring up here. And two, this had no other monetization ways it shows these things still work things like Baldur's gate 3 the, the these are still viable ways of making a lot of money 22 million is an insane number for any game let alone um a single player game no additional you know no dlc or anything like that right they sold it as a finished product and 
they raked in the money and and I, I remember when they sold it and they immediately ported it to other things to to maximize sales and it seems to have worked in their favor and it also goes to show that the way the games industry uses their power does not work and i think that's also interesting to note in the overall discussion around this game as it shows that the fatality in what seemingly people in the industry do have a lot of power they are unable to stop a tsunami like this let's talk about what have you been playing of course this is a question for me but it's also for you at home what have you been playing it's gonna be uh whatever game you've been playing recently over the last week or maybe even over the break that we had of course what have you been playing enjoying let me know in the comments below or of course you tweet at me at you man i have been playing a little bit of bullets gate 3 i'm dipping my toes back in destiny to kind of just cash back up for lack of a better word you know finish the seasonal storyline prep things for the new expansion that is until june so i have plenty of time but i did want to see how the story kind of unfolded for the season we'll get more of it later on but i thought it was good to uh jump back in remind myself why i love the game so much of course that gameplay is some of the best out there bar none uh the writing and dialogue however is not but <laughs> the the gameplay very much overcomes the falls that destiny 2 has and destiny 2 has been in a rough place specifically bungie of course has been in a rough place for a for what seems like a long time now and has been even rougher recently so i like to remind myself when bad things happen that yeah, i still love them of course it's just they're in a rough time and uh, of course they did it to themselves but love loving destiny 2 that the little bit i've been playing bullish gate 3 of course my all right, I won't spoil that, but uh, of course, my top 10 games of the year of last year came in. Go check that out, please, as I had Emmett Walker Jr. on the show. It's doing well uh, with everyone, so first off, thank you for watching that, and uh, give me just do me a favor, go check it out, as I think it's a very good in-depth discussion about, number one, our top games of the year, but two, just how games are evolving, and why our top uh, one, two, three, four games are really special to us in that very year. So I do uh, hope you go check that out. And let me know if you did. And of course, the either the comment section of that video or tweet at me. Uh, as a reminder, I answer every single comment, every single one. See it all, answer every one. So please ask away on anything and everything. Back to what I've been playing. Um, I've been kind of taking a break from gaming mainly just because like the last year was so game heavy. I think that's why I kind of need a break. So I've been kind of relaxing and watching shows or a movie, um, having a more passive experience in my entertainment and not been going too hard into any specific thing. So I'm enjoying my time. Uh, uh, what what's what's some I'll I'll rattle off a few shows. Um, so I finished my Naruto Shippuden rewatch that I did super far long ago. I didn't watch every episode. I did like highlights because I've seen the show already, so I didn't feel like you know looking at all that filler. There's way too much filler in Naruto. Finished that. I started Boruto. I'm a third of the way through that. I want to say. Um, I watched a couple movies. Watched Birdman. That was a very strange, fun movie. I loved how it was shot specifically. I watched um, Chainsaw Man. That was a really good anime. Uh, and I think that's all. I won't bore you too much because you come here, of course, to listen to me talk about video games. So that is everything that I've been playing and a few things that I've been watching. Again, let me know what you've been doing in the comments below. Now let's go over to Rumor Roundup. We have a few rumors this week. A long rumor that has been reported on the show and talked about many times has seemingly finally been put to rest. Reported on by your gamer, but originally said on the Xbox Air podcast by Sheepshill Nick, I believe is how you pronounce it, has said that the rumored Halo Battle Royale being developed by Certain Affinity in collaboration with 343 codename Project Tatanka has been canceled. Now, this was long rumored back in. Oh my god. Um, 2018? Right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's right. When uh, Halo Infinite was first kind of showed off, uh, there was rumors that they were going to do a giant kind of like battle royale with a bunch of people under the stage uh, because that's why there was a bunch of computers there or something. And they canceled it because of Battlefield's battle royale being um, dunked on in these things. And then there were heavy, very compelling rumors from a 
um, I want to say it was Colin Moriarty at that time saying that there was going to be a battle royale for Halo and he doesn't know what happened to it. I'm pretty sure. And then it went quiet. We didn't hear anything. And then we heard about certain affinity. So I'm curious if that was a new project altogether, or if it was like maybe the remnants of what three for three was trying to do. Of course, three for three had so many problems with Halo infinite with one, how it was being made to the, the problems that it kept going into. The game was like remade in like a year and a half or something like that. Uh, the, the writing and all these things. There's a, so, I mean, there are many problems we can go through here that I won't bore you, but this is, Kind of the final nail of confidence, certain affinities kind of battle royale thing. Uh, it is important to note Halo Infinite did kind of have a sort of battle royale mode kind of put into it. I'm curious uh, if that was like to test the waters or something or get like player feedback, but they kind of had like a like you dropped down with a pistol, you picked up guns. I don't remember what the mode was called, but it was kind of what you would think a battle royale would be obviously in a much smaller map, but it was there. Uh, Project Zog, I don't have anything really to to say too much about this as we talked about so much in the show when it was being in, uh, in uh, gestation. Uh, it, if it's canceled, it's probably best it was canceled because it cl clearly was cursed <laughs> from the minute one because it's just been so long. If rumors were true originally that this thing was going on, but I, Hey, who knows? Let's, I think it's best that Halo just kind of finds its voice, and I think it's actually doing really well about that. Halo's very good. If you go play Halo Infinite right now, I, I say it is in a very, very good spot. Uh, ignoring the campaign and just talking about the multiplayer for a second, it it is very good. I think everyone should at least go check it out. If you love Halo at all, I really do think it is in a special spot. The, the weapons feel great. The overall gameplay. I should say... The gameplay was never a problem in multiplayer specifically. It was just the content. But they've had enough time to really get into the content. I did love how they kind of approached the live service angle of, hey, you know, there's a battle pass. It's always in the game. If you bought it, you you can reactivate it anytime. Uh, you and and use that to to still level it up, which is very cool. And I I wished more games did that. It is a shame more games do not do that. That. You buy this battle pass, and I understand what it's for. It's so you keep playing in that time period, and you keep buying it. But I think it's a wise thing to do to be able to incorporate old battle passes into your current one. But enough about that. Hi-Fi Rush, why are we talking about this? Uh, it's, it, well, it might be coming in Nintendo Switch. According to many insiders, like Nate the Hate, Windows Central, I could keep naming people as this came out, and many, many people were sounding off that it might be coming to uh, Nintendo Switch, and it might have been rated by PlayStation 2, who knows, but it's for sure probably coming to Switch at least, at the very minimum. And this kind of caused the hubbaloo. Let me get to the next little room around up uh, to... Uh, to finish out, and then we can talk about it all at once versus kind of splitting it up. To continue this rumor, Sea of Thieves is coming to PlayStation, according to Jeff Grubb of Giant Bomb and Steven Satillo of Axios. Now, now oh God, I, I, I was so excited to talk about this. I don't know how I'm going to uh, like kind of really dig into this. Let's start with Sea of Thieves, because that's the one that makes the most sense, and that's kind of the easier conversation to have. So... As a game as a service, Sea of Thieves, it just really, it really does make sense to get that on many platforms as possible. Why limit it is, is kind of the point I, I'm getting to. Like, you know, if you want Sea of Thieves to thrive in an online environment, maybe you do th throw that on more than one platform. P throw it on a PlayStation, throw it on a Switch. It's already on PC, of course, because it's Microsoft. But I find it interesting um, that they um, haven't done it sooner. Maybe this is maybe a test for future games or to see like what a xbox with these titles will be seen as right is it okay if they release a first party exclusive on a different console will that react negatively in the market now of course we always discuss it and go right get game pass on everything we already heard that from uh tim stewart which we'll be talking about tim stewart a little later too i believe it's tim stewart we're talking about um to discuss sea of thieves in a specific situation i don't think it's nearly that crazy that this is uh going to other platforms as it is the hi-fi rush situation so let's dive right to that i don't think it's quite crazy that sea of thieves is hitting there i think it's weird but xbox is clearly trying things there have long been rumors that 
um xbox has tried this before with other things things uh like halo uh, uh there was a halo ds game uh that was like playable at ign that i've heard about there was um um talks with halo master chief collection coming to playstation years ago right so there's little things like that that have been rumored and pieced out by people uh, in the know that would know these things uh, that we find ourselves that xbox has kind of been dallying with the potential of putting out these titles on other things now i think it's much wiser to test that on your less valuable ip versus a master chief where at the end of the day if you can say xbox is one thing it's halo right like that is the uh mascot for lack of a better word for microsoft right if people think xbox most likely their next thought is halo right that comes to mind i think it's important to test that with something that's not nearly central to the brand then uh and before like throwing that on somewhere and throwing caution to the wind so i respect this test and i actually look forward to it as is it going to be weird to see this on other things now i did see people saying uh this isn't this is the same thing as playstation uh you uh going with mlb i believe that was paris lily i hope that's not incorrect i, I probably shouldn't have even said the name if i don't remember who that specifically was but i'm pretty sure that was him uh he is um uh he works at uh kind of funny on their X cast, uh, which is their Xbox pa uh, podcast. And he's, I believe he brought that up in a tweet and um, I do have to push back on that. And cause he wasn't the only one I saw the people saying this too. Um, uh, that's not the same thing at all. MLB made PlayStation, uh, put it to other platforms. It wasn't like a choice. PlayStation said they wanted to do. It's not the same thing really at all. Uh, MLB forced that PlayStation stands. If PlayStation had their way, wouldn't happen straight up. They would still be on PlayStation. I firmly, firmly believe that. And I think if they could go back to it being on PlayStation, they would also do that. I, I just think that's how PlayStation works. We have no reason to not think that in my opinion, aside from PC ports, which is the, it's not what we're talking about at all. They clearly wanted to be on everything. They probably hit them with a um, amount of money that was irrefutable that like, if you really want exclusive, here's the amount. And they said, no, so they wanted the license, they wanted that money, and they kept it going uh, to keep the gravy chain rolling. And that does make sense in their situation, but that is not the same as the Sea of Thieves situation. One, um, it's not even in the same context as you're talking about PlayStation, the, the number one at the moment. And we're talking about an Xbox, which is the number three if we're talking general console sales, or maybe you're talking about, oh, you, see, you guys see my puppy right there, <laughs> right here. I think she wants to go out. So... Give me a second. I'll be right back. It'll be no time for you, but of course it'll be a little bit of time for me. I told you it'd be no time at all. The magics of recording. I'm talking like it's fucking 1955 and I figured out how to cut two ribbons and put them together. Now, we were discussing Sea of Thieves, Hi-Fi Rush, the exclusivity around Xbox and maybe the uncertain future about it i don't know i think i've talked enough about sea of thieves i want to get into hi-fi rush now this might be a situation because this is a, a japanese studio of course tango gameworks makes this maybe there maybe this is also hey the, here's the small game maybe we'll test throwing this on switch and see if and see if there's i don't know i, I i'll be honest i'm puzzled like are they testing out being a multi-platform studio? Are they testing out, hey, what happens when we put our games on other platforms a year after release or something like that? Maybe in Hi-Fi Rush's specific situation, not see if these, of course. I think I think it's it's close to ten years. I think at this point, um, maybe it is the simple fact that maybe that Hi-Fi Rush specifically. They have say over that game and maybe some sort of thing. Maybe that's what they wanted to do. I, I don't know. This is the one where I am puzzled. Um, it might be as simple as they're testing out multi-platforming by dipping their toes in it. As we have multiple times heard Tim Stewart say, we think we're going to put our stuff on more platforms and these things. That was way, way back um, in November. When was that? October with the, um, I believe it was a Wills Fargo summit. 
talking about, you know, they want Game Pass and their games on all screens, meaning ones that they used to think were competitors. We reported this many, many weeks ago, and maybe this is the start of that. Of course, everyone, I it still really bothers me that two two things bother me about this. One, Phil Spencer came out and was like, there's no plans for Game Pass on PlayStation. And then people were like fully behind this as if like he would tell you like uh, it was very weird. It, it, it's it really disheartening when it feels like we in the industry struggle to think and discuss versus assume maybe or take at face value, especially with things like Xbox, especially with things like the Insomniac League, where it kind of feels like once something is said, everyone feels like they need to agree, which is very frustrating um, in like the very general gaming space, of course, in the more normal, not normal, that's not what I meant, um, the more casual -y space, like not the professional space, I should say. Um, so the the outsider point of view, specifically in my situation, maybe you could you could argue and many others, that's not the case. But specifically in what feels like the professional space, it just kind of feels like everyone's just agreeing with each other. Um, and that I feel like th that Xbox specific situation is just like evidence of that. And it's so frustrating that Jez Gordon didn't immediately pounce on Phil. Like, <laughs> like that's an, and we're, we're circling back to the games journalism thing where. How do we take ourselves seriously when you ask a question? Will Game Pass? I think I think the question was something like, "Will Game Pass come to, to PlayStation or something like that?" And the answer was, "We have no plans." And you don't follow up on that. You just let that slide to Jess Gordon. Like I respect him, by the way. Um, I don't want to feel like I'm picking on him specifically, but you know, how do you not take that a little more seriously? I don't know. It's maybe something I should have brought up more when I reported on the original story. I kind of took it more of a generalist versus a specific person because i don't like being very specific about people because it feels like i'm trying to be mean to them and i'm not and that's an easy way to get clipped out and everyone makes fun of me and stuff so that's not what i'm trying to do i'm just saying that specific situation just frustrates me the more i think about it because one it's so hard to get good gaming journalism really at all uh this is something we had me and nick caldera in our old interview talked about uh i want to november or something you know when he left of course that we discussed that just gaming journalism is hard to find. And I think that's just a prime example of it. It's like, why didn't you jump down his throat? And we all know why it's because one, you don't want, he doesn't want to, you know, like it would probably feel super combative. <laughs> like if he did that and he doesn't want to soil their relationship, that's very, very games journalism. That's kind of what's wrong that everyone is like kind of friendly with everyone. And it's, horrible <laughs> like frankly it's it's kind of like devastating to to like our journalism because everyone just kind of wants that the vibe is friendly and we should all be friendly with each other unless it's like something unavoidable and it feels like cool that people are reporting on it like the moment someone said insomniac leaks weren't cool to report on like no one reported on them and it's like super annoying not no one that's not fair let me back that up i'm getting uh, upset <laughs> that's not true not nobody ign of course report on them um but like just game spot specifically saying they're not gonna report on it, like that's just like for real <laughs> like are you kidding me like are you kidding me like you know how do you call yourself a news site like when you get to pick the news like do you like go to a news site and like expect them to tell you what they want you to know that's like kind of gross right Right? Can't we agree? I don't know. I'm moving on. I, I, I've speak to, enough about this, and I feel like I'm talking everyone's ear off, so I apologize for that. Let's move on to uh, the primary thing of the show. That's, of course, uh, let's talk about the developer direct, and then we're going to talk about a couple other things that the, originally the show was kind of light before. I, originally, I was going to put the developer direct away from um, the main show and just make that a uh, its own video. I decided against that for a few reasons. One, this show was going to be kind of light if I didn't or if I did that because uh, I, I felt like there wasn't a main story that we could all cover um, unless we wanted to talk about gaming numbers for 30 minutes, which can be interesting, but also would just be me kind of speaking numbers at you. Uh, I feel like that's much more better of a discussion versus just me saying numbers. So I wanted to talk about the little bit directory with you today, and I hope you are looking forward to it. Let's get into it.
as I think it was very good. I'll, I'll say my impressions and just give you the news first. So they open with a vow. This is coming fall 2024. Uh, it looks great. You know, let me actually get the Xbox wire up um, for us. Got the Xbox wire open. Let's talk about a vow coming out in fall 2024, of course, by Obsidian. Here's what the Xbox wire has to say. Um, so. Let's talk. Let's see. Not only will you make narrative decisions that can impact changes in the game down the line. How many times have you heard that, people? But Avowed is also looking to offer choice in combat. Gameplay director Gabe Paramo discussed not only how varied your weaponry will be with melee weapons, ranged guns and bows, and magic pick wands, even dual-wielded ones, to name a few, but how flexible combat can be, allowing you to quickly change loadout for enemy encounters. Swappable loadouts mean you can approach combat however feels right to you. Art director Matt Hatton then explained how the Living Lands is a mysterious land made up of wild, varied regions, offering visual, diverse things, blah, blah, blah. About what I saw looked um, pretty good. Um, you know what? Let's get over it. Let's, you know, uh, I'm not going to. Uh, let's go with the meat of the conversation and then let's go back. Hellblade 2, Sanoa Saga. This is coming out May 21st. Very soon. It's, of course, Game Pass. Um, Yeah, so the Xbox War has not really given us much. And um, uh, it leads it leads her to Iceland. So Sinia, of course, leads her to Iceland, a harsh and brutal land ravaged by myth and tyranny. Yeah, so these are these are pretty much like kind of like very small approaches. I thought we'd get a little more in the Xbox wire write ups. But. uh, So there's Hellblade for you. The next up they showed as like a kind of a surprise title as it wasn't mentioned to be there. Visions of Mana. This feels like um. Uh, this of course a uh, uh, developed by Square. This coming summer sometime. This felt like um. This felt like kind of like a. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a ceremonial kind of, or like a sign that like more is to come or something. Like uh, Square being able to to be in like the I, I wouldn't say prestigious, but I mean the very like like controlled and polished develop the wreck these are being able to get square on here it does kind of feel like it's like no you know what we said back in um i think it was uh october or something um when or no it was around tokyo game show something like that i don't remember it phil said you know we're we're working with square to get more things on the platform and this kind of felt like you know we're serious about that uh square is is like this is like the sign of good faith i would say i guess uh, us seeing visions of mana here as there is pretty much no heritage of the mana games being on any xbox platform if i'm remembering correctly uh this is literally the first one so maybe they'll also get more ports or something uh soon to come or, or something along those lines but visions of mana coming to xbox very good sign for our japanese jrpg fans out there of course this is more of an action rpg it's not really uh like like the classical you know turn-based things it, it's it's a Straight up action RPG, so get excited! It looks great. The, the art looks beautiful. I cannot wait. Cannot wait. So the next up is Aria: History Untold. This is by Oxide Games. Um, they made Civ Five. Uh, this is a civilization game. This is coming fall twenty twenty four. It looks beautiful. It, it's pretty Civ. You know, like it's civilization to the T. It's got the pretty much everything you expect. I am a Civ fan. I love Civ Five. Love Civ Six. I own Civ Six on um. Xbox, Jesus Christ. Uh, and I love it. So this is great. I don't really have too much to add here as it looked very similar. It looked more pretty. It's only coming to PC, so no console port yet. I'll be playing it day one. I can't wait, but there's not much else to add as it's a strategy game. If you've played Civ before, it looks like a more like like an actual attempt on making everything actually look like earth and like what like planes would like like and it's still not perfect but it looks very close to like what a real like terrains and these things will look like i'm excited i'll be right there right there day one i'm i do love that games like this still get shown on xbox you know like this isn't really probably gonna like move the needle for like the casual people out there but like you know this is a good shine probably showing to pc people hey you know Keep a lie out. We'll we'll be there for you with PC Game Pass. Maybe to to uh, there'll be like more interesting offers for you on there, possibly. But again, not too much to add here. Fall twenty twenty four. Next up, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle. This is of course, Machine Games. 
Uh, fall 2024. Uh, I loved everything I saw. I think this was game of the show. This is probably my uh, most anticipated game of the year now, next to Hades 2. This looks incredible. Now, the name, bit silly, The Great Circle. I feel like we could have got a little more creative with the naming scheme here, but it looks awesome. It looks like an Indiana Jones game. Troy Baker is Indiana Jones. He's doing a great, great Indiana Jones to me. He, I, I saw a bunch of people saying he's doing like a Harrison Ford impression. Maybe he is. I don't know. And I could have been lost in the sauce because I was having a great time watching that trailer. So maybe I just didn't notice. And upon further viewings, I'll be like, oh, yeah, you know, it's not great. But I loved everything about this trailer. I got to be honest. I loved everything about it. I had a great time. Loved it. Nothing else to add other than I loved it. The combat looks great. The first person looks um, awesome. I was skeptical at first. I mean, like, at first person, hey, yeah, Jones game. But the way it's presented, they know their stuff. I mean, they're, th these are no slouches. Wolfenstein, I mean, come on. So they don't know what they're doing at Machine Games. I have full faith that this is going to be a great game. Hey, they've nailed Indiana Jones so far. He looks great. Sounds great. His mannerisms look great. The, um, the way he was interacting with combat and the way you were... Uh, utilizing his moves look great i nothing nothing to add other than very excited can't wait for more that was pretty much the developer direct and i didn't really have too much to expound upon because this was just a great direct this had everything i think a developer direct should have very focused uh it didn't sit on anything too long it was a great look at developers of course it being in the name it should be and i love that it, you do kind of feel like you're being shown a game that people are passionate about. You kind of feel the passion through the screen. And I think they do really well with that little funny things throughout the video too, with, um, uh, Oxide games. Um, what was his name? Oh, I blanked out his name already, but a guy came and grabbed a drink and walked by and they stopped the thing and like made fun of the situation. And he's like, Oh, we started out of his basement, which is like, you know, like little things like that add personality to these, which I very much enjoy. And it's, frankly unique um directs aren't that really they seem much more for the consumer i guess i would say and state of plays are straight up here's the game there's no people here's here is highlights of the games this is what we want you to be excited about get excited no one you don't even know the voices here you go and this you know it feels a little more personal i like that really does feel good it was in 4k 60 frames which i love watch that on youtube it looked crisp felt amazing loved it loved everything about it i really think they should keep this moving forward i saw people like oh, i want more of these i'm like only if you can do more of them and keep them this way if this is the high quality that you can keep up you can do two a year nice i wouldn't be mad if we do one a year two a year you know i'm not upset about that i think these are high quality and we're always excited for them so I think a look at what's coming for the year is a great way to handle these. And, you know, I want to see, like, what's coming out this year, not next year. Like, what's this year, you know? And I love that about them. Very excited. Indiana Jones, most anticipated game now. Mm, let's talk about... Let's talk up. Let's, let's stick with Xbox, actually. Let's stick with Xbox and... Really expound. Since we're discussing Xbox, let's not forget we brought up Microsoft earlier with... Mm, you know what? No. Yes. Let's stick with this. Let's talk about Microsoft. And I think this is really indicative of what we can expect from Microsoft. And we've discussed it earlier. And this is a sign of more things to come. We got it from Tom Stewart, and now let's hear it from the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Right. So let's go. So this is over on IGN. I'm gonna read straight from them because I didn't have time to do a, a write up before the show because this line, this came out earlier today around the uh, developer direct. They're a little bit after. With the acquisition of Call of Duty at Maker Activision Blizzard, Microsoft can now be quote a good publisher end quote across all platforms, including rival consoles. The boss of the company has said, speaking with Bloomberg, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella said, "quote We love gaming. In fact, Flight Simulator was created before even Windows, but we were number three, number four, and now with Activision, I think we have a chance of being a good publisher. Quite frankly, on Sony and Nintendo and PCs and Xbox, we're excited about that acquisition closing, and I'm glad we've got it through." End quote. Mm 
we've got him saying we're going to be a good publisher, right? So we're already knowing, like, okay, so it sounds like Activision Blizzard's not going anywhere for the foreseeable future for any other major platforms, at least, right? Or at least their major games. We are hearing Satya Novello saying, hey, you know, we have a chance of being a good publisher, right? Maybe they're going to be moving into a more publisher window. Who knows? Maybe they'll only, you know, mm. I feel like this almost deserves its own show as well with the Game Pass conversation because this melds so well into what is an Xbox that goes fully behind a Game Pass. If we keep saying to ourselves, you know, uh, Xbox is fully committed to Game Pass. Well, that does mean a lot of things. One, that means that they're going to be interested in a service that can be played anywhere, just like Tom Stewart, their CFO, said uh, months ago. And that also means that they could be working in a publishing window because Game Pass itself, in of itself, is a service that can be applied to anything with the right amount of um, ingenuity and utility and these things, right? So we already are seeing it on TVs and these things, and we already know that... Uh, the only reason Game Pass isn't on PlayStation is because of PlayStation, not Xbox. They, you know, they want to be on there, right? Switch, most likely the same exact situation, right? And they might be in this situation, and I've been saying this for a long time, is they're forcing others' hands, and maybe at some point down the line, they're going to maybe move away from consoles and become this kind of publisher kind of figure with Game Pass and be a more Netflix situation where they don't really care where you're at, as long as you're paying for your subscription and playing on uh, something called Game Pass, right? I don't think uh, that is the near future, although the plans in the leaked FTC things are very, very, very disturbing. As they, uh, in late 2030 or 34, something, I remember... But uh, that was specifically saying, you know, there were no plans for consoles, it seemed like. It seemed like it was like more of a streaming box, which is not a feature I would like. And if we're moving to something like that, that would argue, like, why would you, you know, invest in the ecosystem? Uh, one, as a consumer, and two, as the makers of that said product, why would you make a thing, right? Why do you need to make this to them what that uh, xbox series x probably cost them 480 490 to make you know so they're not making money off that why do we need that when uh we have a competitor now seen as a partner making it for us taking the costs on getting a box into people's houses we can incorporate that into our um into our systems and just go straight into the um console sharing the console share back up here. I'm, I'm losing my losing my thoughts here. Backing up from from the full point of view, Xbox seeing a situation where all they need to do is move from one console share pie. Right. So we're we're they're They're dealing with the smallest share of the pie. Right. They have the smallest ecosystem compared to switch and compared to PlayStation. But immediately destroying barriers, you now have 100 percent of the console share. Meaning why in their situation, if Game Pass is their end goal and what they want to be, why not eliminate the barriers that show that you are only 25, 30% of the market, maybe less than that. You destroy those barriers, you are now 100% of the market if you can get it on your quote-unquote competitors' ecosystems, right? You're already on PC. Phil Spencer has said console is flattened and plateaued because... At a certain point, you have everyone, right? PC is probably the same same spot eventually. So what's left? You go to Switch. You go to TVs. You go to phones. You go to uh, PlayStation. And we're seeing that. They're, we already hear that they're making a mobile store to try and rival Apple, Google. And we'll see how that pans out. But that's clearly going to be a Game Pass machine. They're going to try and make an arcade, uh, Apple arcade situation on mobile. Of course, of course, Game Pass working on a mobile is going to be perfect for them because they want to hit the billions of people who have a phone. That makes sense, of course. But being able to eliminate barriers that you're only able to get X amount of people because you're on Xbox, now you're able to get X amount of people because you're now on Switch and PlayStation is a perfect opportunity for them if their focus is Game Pass, which is everyone saying, of course, right? They do care about their games because they're coming to the service that is called Game Pass. And I'll be curious to see if this is something that 
we will see the fruitions of, or is this something that's just going to fall apart? I've talked many a times about the numbers and them not really necessarily making sense. Uh, they don't start these things expecting to make money on them in the near future. That's just how business works. Netflix notoriously has barely made any money ever in its entire existence. Uh, you can argue maybe that's the nature of the beast in how Netflix is managed or something, but but online that is true. And maybe that is my, how Microsoft views it, that, you know, they're probably fine not turning a profit until they have a control of the market space like a Netflix. Once they become a Netflix, they don't give two shits how much they spend on it because now it's the Netflix, right? And that could be where we're seeing Microsoft go with how they're going to be viewing this service, eliminating these barriers, eliminating what they view as competition. Again, Tim Stewart saying all this. And being on whatever plays and has a screen, just like he said. And if that means it, that means you become less of a platform holder and more of a publishing unit. And I think we'll see that come to pass if they stick to their guns. And I think they will. That This seems like the, the path for the foreseeable future. If that is a path that they want, that is something I will not be joining them in, unfortunately. As I, I like having a box. I don't want to stream things. And I don't want to... Uh, do any of that in the near future. Of course, things can change in 2040 or something like that, but right now, it doesn't feel like a feature I'd be a part of because uh, streaming doesn't seem that fun, but hey, I could be wrong. We'll have to see. Thank you for letting me expound on that because feeling the developers in what clearly Microsoft is doing is getting a portion of the industry to maybe hold some sort of hostage situation to in, to force other publishers to put Game Pass on their system. I don't know. We'll have to see. We'll have to see. And again, this deserves its own video one day, and I promise that will happen. Now let's talk about Suicide Squad Killer Justice League. That was kind of pretty big in the news cycle, I believe. Um, as I was seeing all around, people's negative impressions, people's positive impressions... And everywhere in between with various people trying out the alpha, the alpha beta, you know, not alpha, but the beta for it and these things talking about it. I think it actually was an alpha test, which doesn't make sense. Um, and we're due for it very soon. And I actually found out one of my close friends, uh, Dan from Podcast BXN, discussed a lot about that. First off, on his show that I'll try and remember to link below and his specific segment on this. But of course, his show has the full thoughts on what he thinks about Suicide Squad Killer Justice League. But let's, get, let's read a quote from him, and then I'm going to expound a little bit about what I've been seeing when I think about what's going to be happening with Rocksteady uh, in the near and long future. So this is Dan from PXN, quote. Uh, and of course, he played the beta. This is his impressions. Quote, I really just don't understand the entire premise of what the game actually is. Like, why is it just a generic third-person shooter throw, through the through which you've experiencing the story through which you're experiencing the story i'm sorry i just misread that they missed a big opportunity uh, in my opinion uh, to deliver a unique experience with a unique attack methods for each of the characters for example king shark being able to have shark like attacks instead of just shooting enemies with a gun also the cooldowns and some of the abilities make them not fun to use for instance harley's grapple would have been a perfect opportunity to make her as a spider-man like character swinging around with the grapple but the cooldown breaks it up just enough to make it not fun to traverse all that being said, the story bits were super interesting to me, and I found the cutscenes and the overall tone of the story something I would probably dig. It's just a matter of if I can convince myself to play the game and endure the gameplay and climatics that I don't love, end quote. So, not a very glowing review, of course. Uh, not a review, I apologize. Uh, not glowing impressions of what he played, but there is kind of glimmer of hope kind of scattered within that quote, I believe. Um... Of course, the story being interesting, and I did hear that a lot about what people were playing. The story itself, quite interesting in Suicide Squad. Kill just think, and they're fine, and they like the dialogue. That was a lot of the clip saying, like, oh, I, you know, I like this dialogue. I, I love this joke by this guy, you know, and it was a lot of that. And then it was a lot of, you know, I have a minigun, I'm shooting with King Shark, this boss design's weird, this thing's happening, I don't love it, why is this, you know, and it was a lot of things, and I think... Uh, Dan kind of summarizes a lot of it very well, and he's very intelligent with how he uh, sees games. So it is a perfect example of of seeing, you know, why is this a third person shooter? That is a great question, right? This is, of course, Rocksteady coming from their Batman games, and of course, their co-founders left a while ago. And we see that here. And I remember um, seeing this morning, I believe that 
Ryan McCaffrey actually retweeted a um, article he wrote, I believe, saying uh, his idea is um, they might have he they probably left because Suicide Squad killed Jesse might have t- tarnished their very good reputation. Uh, and in a few months, they'll make a studio and lo and behold, here we are. They're making a studio and they probably got out while the gint was good. And this could be a situation where we find ourselves in. This seems just like not a spectacular game. It seems like a middle of the road. It's going to come out. It was fine. Rocksteady wasted decade of their time on this unfortunately uh, this was clearly uh in trouble for a very long time and they just probably couldn't figure it out clear as day the story hopefully will keep it up i will be playing this day one but uh the impressions are not very good i do hope they work something out with how the game is because just everything i'm hearing about it is just a huge damper i will be playing hopefully it is good enough but it does seem It does seem like, hey, let's take these characters with very identifiable personalities and frankly, easily in ingrainable elements of gameplay and wipe it all away and have them shoot guns. It's very strange, right? Each character they're using have very unique ways of engaging in combat. One guy is literally called Captain Boomerang and he's shooting guns. Weird. He should just be using boomerangs. King Shark should be a brute that uses shark checks, just like Dan says. Harley Quinn, bats and mallets and hyenas. You know, she could use her hyenas. She could use bombs and Joker abilities and these things. And then, of course, we have Deadshot, which should probably be the only one actually using a gun. Like, he could have been the shooting class, and everyone else could have been kind of like variations of melees. That's kind of perfectly how it works. Two melee characters, two long-range characters, medium-range uh, between Captain Boonerang and Deadshot. And maybe that's what they tried and they couldn't work. And they were like, just give them guns and, and it makes it easier. But there was just silly, silly little things that I've seen throughout the game with with items and weapons that people are using and, and just lots of things that are just doesn't really make sense at all. Like, why was this the why? Why was this done? <laughs> why did you waste 10 years on this? You could have made two games in that time and you've they've probably dumped hundreds of millions of dollars into this over the course of 10 years and they're gonna probably not get much return but you know that's not fair because gotham knights sold incredibly well on name alone it critically panned but didn't matter it sold very well because it had gotham in the name this probably is the same situation where they'll probably recoup most if not all the costs and they'll move on to the next thing but it is a shame that we lost Rock City for 10 years and we're probably getting an okay game out of them, which is frankly a disaster. I want to talk quickly on a couple things. Um, so Matt Piscatel, a great follow on Twitter, by the way, and he is a great uh kind of aggregator for a lot of things and his ideas and these things. He's very smart. I love following him. He's good, he's a good follow. Uh he showed the um sales charts from both December and the entire year of 2023 that you can go check out on his Twitter. And uh, I'm going to be discussing the specifically the top 20 games of the year. Now, this is important to note, and this is important to know, especially for the number one slot uh, and the number five slot specifically, because this is not a full, this is how much everything sold. We don't have that information. I don't believe there's ever been a point where we have had complete total information publicly available uh, via any means, maybe in the NES and SNES era, maybe PS1 era. I don't know. Uh, That's before my time. But right now, it's important to note these specific things. So this list, physical and full game digital from the Nintendo eShop, PlayStation, Steam, and Xbox Xbox platforms for publishers in the digital leader platform ranked on dollar sales. Now, there's a lot of things that are not reported specifically. So at the very bottom here, digital sales are not included for some that I will be specifically saying. Mostly, I think it's all Nintendo and some other ones. Um, and then there, there is some Xbox and, digi- and Xbox and Switch digital sales not included in some of these as well. Let's see. Excludes add-on spending, of course. And then this is all done at the discretion of the publishers. This is given to them, not not like there's some database that they access and get all this information. For instance, um, 
Larian does not report to them at all. So Baldur's Gate 3 is not on here. One, be, be, maybe it didn't, it wouldn't have reached, or maybe it would have, but again, they don't report them. I believe um, Remedy doesn't either. And there's a, you know, a bunch of publishers that, that don't. But let's read, let's read, because they're fun. So I'm going from 20 to 1, okay? And this is sale, sold through. Minecraft, Mario Kart, of course, digitally for Nintendo not included. 18, Elden Ring. 17, Street Fighter 6. 16, Final Fantasy 16. 15, Diablo, uh, Diablo, Jesus, Dead Island 2. 14, MLB The Show 2023. This does not include Xbox and Switch Digital. Uh, 13, Resident Evil 4. 12, Super Mario Bros. Wonder, of course, doesn't include digital. Number 11, Starfield. Number 10, EA Sports Football Club 2024. Number 9, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. Very impressive. Number 8, Mortal Kombat 1. Number 7, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2. Which is incredible. It's the previous Call of Duty. Number 6, Diablo 4. Number 5, Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Of course, not including digital sales. Number 4, Marvel Spider-Man. Number 3, Madden NFL 2024. Number 2, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. And number 1, Hogwarts Legacy. Incredible. Because, again, Hogwarts Legacy not um the first time it is beaten a call any game has beaten call of duty since 2008 incredible incredible unheard of frankly um i found uh that incredibly eye-opening as one it shows that harry potter means uh, a lot <laughs> still um i definitely didn't think just thing a thing being harry potter would make it sell that much uh clearly the reviews of the game didn't really matter because most of the reviews were just like you know it's fine which doesn't really drive that doesn't drive sales so clearly like no one really cared about how it was reviewed they just bought it probably because it was hogwarts and they just sold the just a ridiculous amount marvel spider-man uh in, incredibly impressive again because they launched at the near the end of the year same as you know call of duty and these things these are always very impressive because they sell at the end of the year now games generally sell the most when they're released so you know this is crazy but still impressive Anything else I think is interesting? Um, Starfield not being in the top 10, pretty crazy. Of course, Game Pass affecting sales, I'm sure. Um, I think they mitigated, honestly, a lot of that with the early sales, the way they worked with, like, you paid early to get to get it early. So there's probably a lot of things. Maybe that, yeah, that's a good point. Was that counted? Probably, right? Um, if you have, like, Game Pass, there was, like, a cheap, cheaper version that you could get and you know there's a lot of different things about that too but i found that interesting um MLB, mlb yeah probably where you expect because it's not including all digital sales um final fantasy 16 that hurts a little bit you know that's real low i'm curious if it sold enough for square to be happy i imagine although i can't fathom how much that cost and it's crazy that oh the ring still on the charts single player game incredible for them and that's the news for the week. Let's go to date updates. The PlayStation Plus games for the month. I know I'm late to this, but I wanted to read them anyways. Plague's Tale Requiem. That's your PS5 game. Evil West, PS4 and PS5. And Nobody Saves the World, PS4, PS5. Of course, that is the um, PlayStation Plus Essential, the lowest uh, subscription tier. That is the one I am at. And this is for extra and premium. So if you pay for premium, you're getting all of this. If it's extra, you're getting Tiny Tina's Wonderland Next Level Edition. Uh, Resident Evil 2, Hard Space Shipbreaker, Lego City Undercover, Just Cause 3, Session Skate Sim, Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun, Vampire the Masquerade Swan Song, Surviving the Aftermath, and then this is only for premium people, Rally Cross, Star Wars Episode 1 of Phantom Menace, Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection, Legend of Mana, and Secret of Mana. And then let's read the Game Pass games for January. And this is everything... Uh, so as of recording, this is going to be live right now. Turnip Boy robs a bank cloud console and PC. That's available day one on Game Pass. F1 2023 console and PC. This is via e EA Plays. Um, so you have to have Game Pass Ultimate or PC Game Pass, I believe. Uh, Pal World. This is on the 19th. So as you're listening to this, this is also available. This is available day one on Game Pass. That's the Pokemon with Guns game. Go Mecha Ball. This is Cloud Console and PC January 25th. Another available day one on Game Pass game. Brotato. I've heard a lot of people actually really like this game. This is January 30th. Cloud Console and PC. That's it's like it, it says it's a roguelike arena shooter. I saw a lot of people liking this. You're literally a potato that can have guns. Persona 3 Reloaded. Very excited about this February 2nd. Cloud Console and PC. This is available day one on Game Pass. I mean, Persona 3. Are you kidding me? I'm going to be all over this. Cannot wait. A new chard. 
I think. Cloud Console PC February 6th. And that's all your Game Pass games. Now, this is everything leaving the month of January. Hitman World of Assassination, Cloud Console PC. That is every Hitman game, if I remember right. Hitman 1, 2, and 3. So that's all games leaving. F1 2021, Cloud Console and PC EA Play. And that's it for Game Pass. Moving on, Cloud, uh, Golden Sun uh, and Golden Sun... So Sorry, Golden Sun, the 2001 GBA game, and Golden Sun, The Lost Age, 2002... GBA game have been added to Nintendo Switch's online service. So that is live as of recording. Very, very cool. These are the Game Boy games, not the original games. I believe they are not on the service, but I can't remember the original ones. But these are the Game Boy games, and people love those as well. Stalker 2 have been delayed to late this year after testing um, from fans, seeing the game needed more time. This was via VGC, VGC. So this was delayed yet again. Of course, not. Uh, crazy because one they're a ukrainian studio obviously they would have to delay game uh, previously and also this means that it needs more work as well so this is the delay past that as well so hope hope for them the best given giving them all my well wishes hope everyone's safe over there and now this is a, and i believe they relocated so they i don't believe they're still in ukraine i can't remember though now this is what's queued up of course this could be a game a tv show a movie a podcast a manga anything really let me know what you have queued up for the weekend i will be telling you when i have queued up for the weekend I think I'm going to keep watching some boards. So I'm going to be playing Prince of Persia and Last of Us Part 2, probably going between those two. Some light destiny catching up because I'm very, very behind in a lot of things. Although, actually, you know what? I'm not really that behind. I'm, I'm caught up in most stuff. So I'll probably be focusing on my more single player games until I believe January 30th. We'll get some content there. But aside from that, that's going to be it for me this week. Thank you so much for joining me as this was a incredibly thorough show this week I, we got really in depth with xbox i'm very happy about that and i am due for just a xbox discussion like where we get into the nitty-gritty talk about money talk about where the platform is going to be in the next maybe decade and maybe we'll hypothesize a lot and see where we are and where we're going to land with that specific venue of discussion we'll see thank you so much for listening and until next time go chief